five New York Mets look forward to a new image and a comeback year after a disappointing 1974. Shea Stadium would welcome a host of new faces in 75. Outfielder Del Unser. Brooklyn-born Joe Torre. Rookie catcher John Stearns. Shortstop Mike Phillips. Veteran pinch hit specialist Jesus Salou. Relief pitcher Tom Hall. Fireballing Randy Tate. Relief ace Ken Sanders. Young fireman Rick Baldwin. Hard throwing Hank Wells. Relief specialist Skip Lockwood. Rookie outfielder Mike Vail. And long ball threat Dave Kingman. Over a dozen new faces for Met fans to meet and greet during the 1975 season. Sports fans, this is Lindsay Nelson. The 1975 Amazing Mets film is being brought to you by the good folks at Dairy Lee. Yes, Dairy Lee and all their guaranteed fresh line of great dairy products were with us each and every day right here at Shea Stadium. In 1976, the Amazing Mets will field an exciting lineup of winners. And this lineup of great Dairy Lee products is a winner, a guaranteed fresh winner. Perhaps no single addition to the Mets lineup has ever captured the fans' imagination the way Dave Kingman did. Playing third base, first, left field, or at bat, Dave always gave his best, and he was just as pleased with his move to New York as New Yorkers were with him. When I got a phone call from Joe McDonald in San Francisco and informing me of the trade, it was a great surprise. Um, I had a little rough going in Candlestick, and then just uh, coming to a place like Shea Stadium, you can't come to a better place. It's, it's a great ballpark, it's a great town, you can't find a better town, and for the most part, the, uh, the people are the best, the greatest fans around. I'd say playing in New York is one of the biggest thrills uh, that I've had. After a slow start, Dave Kingman walloped 36 home runs. Only one man in the major leagues, Mike Schmidt of Philadelphia, hit more. Dave's 36-round trippers also established a new single-season Mets record. Hit the ball hard is, is my main object, and when I try to do that, it's uh, when I have greatest results, is when I can extend my arms the fullest and, and uh, hit the ball at, um, when it's down and away, or uh, a low pitch generally is the one I can hit uh, the furthest. Most home run hitters are streak hitters. Uh, they come in bunches, and it's, it's a, you know, no way to uh, give a reason for this. It's, it's, it's very hard to do. You go up there, some days you, you hit two, sometimes maybe even three. Uh, most of the time you just hit one, but hitting them in bunches uh, is usually the, the case with most home run hitters. But sometimes a uh, home run isn't needed to win a ball game, and just getting on base uh, to be driven in or, or sometimes driving in a run with a bunt uh, sometimes uh, is the answer. I've taught myself to become very relaxed, especially in a clutch situation where uh, you need just a single or a home run to win the ball game. And, and when I produce uh, when I do is, is a result of being totally relaxed. Big Dave must have been totally relaxed at all the appropriate moment. He led the Mets with a grand total of 20 game-winning hits. Dave also helped present another side of the New York Mets organization, community involvement. Whoa! Face it! <laughs> Met players make frequent appearances throughout the metropolitan area. When you go up there, you got a bat you like, you get up there, a lot of guys crouch over. Some guys stand straight up and down. But you have to do something that feels good to you. You know, uh, the most important thing about uh, getting a good feeling in the batter batter's box, you have to have balance on both feet. Uh, once in a while, I get a little too anxious, and I start trying to swing too hard, and when I come out, of the, instead of watching the ball, I start coming off the ball. So if you watch the ball, and you go right into the pitch, you've got to be able to hit it. Yes? Who do you think is the hardest pitcher for you to hit off? Uh, they're all real tough. They are not an, there is an easy pitcher out there, but being able to go up there with a bat in your hand that feels good to you is very important. That's the thing you start out with. Next, you have to get a, <clears throat> a good stance. You know, a lot of guys, uh, you have to do something that feels good to you. Well, practice and practice and practice what you're told, and, and that's what really, uh, when it starts to pay off, when you start 
uh, doing the things right, and then it starts to become habit. And when it starts to become habit, then you don't have to think about it anymore, and then you go up there and you just do it right every time. That's only as a, as a result of practice and habit. The boys and girls of the Thornton Donovan Challenge Day Camp will long remember Dave's visit. Meanwhile, back at Shea, fans of all ages remember the special event dates on the schedule. They're all a barrel of fun. special events, Old Timers Day really brings on that nostalgic feeling. Joe DiMaggio, Willie Mays, Ralph Kiner, and so many greats of yesteryear grace Shea Stadium on a memorable day. Of course, the loyal Met fans keep the turnstile spinning on Helmet Day and Photo Album Day, Harry Lee Day, Banner Night, Family Day, and all the other big events, too. But every date is special, and you never know what surprise might be in store, like a visit from soccer star Pele, by WNEW Radio's Julius La Rosa. The Mets and Shea provide the perfect combination for food, fun, and a rooting good time. A Mets game is New York's best dollar value in sports entertainment. And this year, there'll be some brand new special event days on the schedule. Home crowds total over one and three quarter million in 1975. And more and more fans discovered that the Mets group sales department can provide the ideal ticket for family entertainment. Thousands of organizations and clubs take advantage of this convenience every year like this group from Massapequa. The old sports fans, the old Met fans now, but they, uh, everybody likes to get to a ball game. And it's a good way to go in and have a lot of fun. Everybody talks, root for the Mets, root for the Mets. They feel that if they go in by bus, they don't have to worry about parking. They know how to come back. They're gonna, uh, the bus is waiting for us there. And they have a, a ball. It's a really good. And we have a mixed crowd. We have a young crowd, a middle-aged crowd. And they all enjoy the game. I think it's very enjoyable, and I think more people should do it. I work all day, I travel an hour back and forth, and in order to go to the Met game, this is the way to go. Be the driving to the bus driver, and just have a relaxing time. Getting there is fun in itself, but another highlight is seeing your group name up in lights during a red-hot ball game. can't be promised a foul ball at its feet, but one of the stadium's friendly ushers made somebody awfully happy to have been on the scene. Moments later, everybody shared their good time celebrating a Mets home run. of the Mets family who specialized in home run hitting was honored with baseball's highest and most coveted reward. He is Ralph Kiner. If you remember the, my major league career, I had the unfortunate experience of playing with some losing teams. To give you an example of what kind of a team we had at Pittsburgh when I was playing there, Joe Garagiola was our catcher. <laughs> But I do want you to know this is really a tremendous thrill for me, and 
I really, it's hard to put it in perspective. And I guess about the best analogy that I could think of would be the fact that it's almost like after years and years of hard work to become a doctor, say seven years or whatever it might take, that you finally get a stamp of approval, an MD after your name. And the fact that I have a HOF after my name really makes it all so wonderful and also worth, worthwhile. It's a, it's a tremendous thrill and a tremendous honor, and I want to thank all of you who are, who are here today and all of you that couldn't make it, and it's, uh, it's just a great pleasure. Thank you. And to Hall of Famer Ralph Kiner, a hearty congratulations from all of baseball. You can't get elected to the Hall of Fame until your playing career has ended. But they might as well reserve some room for Tom Seaver right now. After a painful 11 and 11 season in 74, Seaver had a spectacular year that concluded with his third Cy Young Award, a 22 and 9 mark, and strikeout plateaus that give him additional space in the record manual. In this, his ninth season with the Mets, Tom approached his 2000th career strikeout in midseason. The magic moment arrived with Dan Dreesen of the Cincinnati Reds at bat. Tom went to the breaking ball against Dreesen, got two quick strikes jamming him in on the hands, then went outside for number 2000. Seaver remembers it well. Well, getting my 2000 strikeout, it's, uh, it wasn't really just another number, but it, uh, it was in the middle of a tough ball game against Cincinnati, and uh, I, I was aware of it. I knew it would be number 2000. It obviously is a big number, and, and uh, I, I think uh, I'll go on, hopefully, to strike out 3,000 people, and, and uh, 2,000 will be, have been just a step in that direction. On September 1st, with a gala holiday crowd cheering him on, Tom Seaver was on the verge of a strikeout record that would put him at the top of the cream of the crop. No major league pitcher had ever put together eight consecutive seasons of 200-plus strikeouts. Manny Sanguian is coming up, walked and had a base hit. Swing and a miss, it's strike one. Sanguian is hitting 324. He is a tough man at the plate. Seaver now sets checks back over his shoulder, deals to strike one, pitch one on and miss. Came with a fastball, it's 0-2. And, and the crowd here is riding with Seaver on every pitch. They're very knowledgeable. They know exactly what the circumstances are with regard to records and everything else. Two strike count to Sagi and Seaver sets up now. Checks back over his shoulder. Here's the pitch. Well, and miss. Quick him out. An ovation for Seaver, who has struck out 200 batters. Rudy turns and tosses the ball over to the dugout. That'll be placed among Seaver's souvenirs. He is the only pitcher in the history of Major League Baseball to strike out 200 or more batters in eight successive seasons. He's getting a standing ovation at Shea. Tom Seaver. The only pitcher in all the long history of Major League Baseball to strike out 200 or more batters in eight successive seasons. It was a great moment for Tom, and one that he'll never forget. The strikeout mark for me was very emotional, all things considered. Um, there were a lot of things in the ball game. We were still in the pennant race, and it was a uh, records are, are funny things. You don't really appreciate them while you're while, while you're accomplishing them, but after a while, they become. I think during the winter, they become very significant. Uh, probably during, this, during the winter for me, I'll be able to sit back and evaluate uh, what I did and, and appreciate it much more than I did, say, during that evening. It was a very... Catcher Jerry Grody shared Seaver's satisfaction. Probably, uh, one of my highlights, again, is one of those days that uh, I got goosebumps just thinking about it. The other one was, of course, the, the game that Seaver pitched uh, several years ago against the Cubs, as he calls it, his imperfect game. But those two Raiders my biggest thrills uh, as far as catching Tom Seaver. Jerry Grody did much more than catch Tom Seaver. It was his finest major league season. Catching is a position, I believe, that uh, doesn't ever really get the publicity that I really feel that it should, the defensive part of it especially. Uh, if you throw guys out, it's one thing. Uh, they might be written up, but it's shortly forgotten. Calling a good ball game, if a pitcher does a real good job, uh, it throws the ball just exactly, say, where you call the pitch or something. It works out great. Uh, and more than likely, you're going to get a little ink on it because the pitcher is going to say something. All the things that I've been, I guess, looking for for all the years, that all of a sudden, everything fell into place. What the reason behind it was is probably any one of, uh, it could be any one of a number. Phil Cavaretta helped me a great deal with my hitting. He uh, 
did several minor things to my uh, stance, uh, nothing major, and I, that seemed to be uh, a big point in my hitting, too. Jerry batted 295 to establish a personal high. Another met with a gratifying statistic, John Matlack posted 16 victories, his best in four major league seasons. John also notched a win as the victorious all-star game pitcher for the National League while sharing the game's most valuable player award with Bill Madlock of Chicago. Jerry Kuzman found himself succeeding in two pitching tasks. Making his first relief appearances since 1972, Jerry registered two saves in that category to go along with 14 wins as a starter. In 1975, may have uncovered the relief ace every team envies in Bob Apodaca. Bob had 13 saves and compiled a brilliant 1.48 earned run average. Felix Mian enjoyed a productive and healthy season, appearing in all 162 games on the schedule. One of only three players in the National League to do so. Steady in the field as always. Dion had a consistent year at the plate too, setting new team records for doubles and total hits. The other half of the usual Mets double play combination had his entire season curtailed by injury woes. Bud Harrelson played in just 34 games. Garrett made 1975 one of his best seasons ever with improvement at bat that resulted in his highest yearly batting average. It was not an enjoyable campaign for John Milner, but he's hoping to regain that home run stroke in 76. Ed Cranepool in his 14th season with the Mets and still only 31 keeps improving with age. Steady Eddie led all Met hitters with a solid 323 mark. His second consecutive 300 season. Rookie pitcher Randy Tate definitely possesses a major league arm. Randy battled control problems and a lack of experience. But he'll be counted on in future Met plans. On one occasion against Montreal, Randy displayed his potential with superb pitching that had Shea Stadium in an uproar. For seven innings, he had the Expos completely stymied. Did Randy Tate become the first Met pitcher to hurl a no-hitter? Randy started off the eighth inning with a strikeout, his 12th of the contest. But his bid for immortality lasted only one more pitch. His no-hit bid ruined, Randy was rewarded with a standing ovation from the Shea Stadium faithful. The Mets obtained relief specialist Ken Sanders midway through the season, and he responded with a sparkling 2.30 earn run average. Briggs won at the International League in complete games and was named Pitcher of the Year. His promise may materialize in a big way in 76. A pleasant surprise for New York Met fans was shortstop Mike Phillips. Mike filled in for the sideline Bud Harrelson very capably after coming to the Mets from San Francisco. Mike was steady at the plate as well as in the field, and he led the team in triples. Rookie catcher John Stearns was the nation's number two selection in the 1973 free agent draft and might very well be a star of the future. Although he was not expected to make the team in spring training, his excellent defensive play made him the ideal backup for Jerry Grody. The Mets' search for a gifted center fielder came to an abrupt halt with Dill Unser in the lineup. Dill tracked down everything with style and grace. His defensive abilities leave nothing to be desired while his offensive contribution produces the correct weapon for each specific situation.
Veteran Joe Torrey came to the Mets from St. Louis and provided experience and leadership to a young team. Joe's run production fell off in 75, but he's pointing toward a return to hitting form for the coming year. Joe shared third base chores with Wayne Garrett, but 1976 may find him more often across the diamond at first, with the International League's RBI champion, Roy Steger, getting a shot at the hot corner. One of the late arriving new faces of 1975 provided some of the most exciting moments. The International League's batting champion and most valuable player as well, Mike Vail joined the Mets in August after a tremendous season in the minors. Mike was assigned to Tidewater in the spring to play every day and prepare himself for the eventual call that was sure to come for such a talented youngster. I was just happy when I stayed at AAA and made the team and everything, and then I tried to do my best at Tidewater, and uh, fortunately it worked out for me that I made it to the Major League this year. And when he made it, he made it big. Mike Vail's initial at bat in Shea Stadium resulted in this home run. became the talk of the town as he ran up a lengthy consecutive game hitting streak that threatened the Major League rookie record of 26 straight games. For someone who was only in his first month of big league baseball, it was quite an achievement and a quick introduction to the pressures that go with it. It's funny, but right around 14, 16 and all those, you know, around 17, I wasn't really too concerned with the streak at that time, but uh, where most of the attention came from it was uh, when it got around 22 and 23, most of the media uh, really let me know that I was getting close to it. Well, with a 22-game hitting streak, Mike batting 340, Roger sets. Here's the pitch. Vale gets a base hit right to the middle of the center field. for a rookie for consecutive games with at least one base hit at 23. A single to center field, and he gets a standing ovation. The very next night, Mike's streak ended during an 18-inning marathon. It is three balls and no strikes to Dell Unser. Now he's into his windup. Here's the pitch. Outside, ball four. The Mets have won the ball game. Unser walks on four pitches. Roy Steger is forced home. The Mets win it in the bottom half of the 18th inning. The final score, the New York Mets four and the Montreal Expos three. I mean, I uh, really tried hard and get my hit. I had many chances to get it. I know that. I had seven times the bat, but uh, I, just, I just couldn't manage to get that hit. <laughs> Even so, Mike's 23-game streak was the longest in the majors for 1975. This year, the plan is for Mike to move over to his natural position in right field and it figures that he'll be the man to secure that spot for many seasons to come. Last year's regular right fielder, Rusty Staub, was traded to Detroit for a young promising outfielder, Billy Baldwin, and all-star left-hander, Mickey Lulich. Lulich is being counted on to round out an awesome starting rotation. Lulich owns the all-time strikeout record for Southpaws and has racked up 207 career victories. Although 1975 was an off year, Mets special assignment scout Bob Sheffy rates Lolich as having some outstanding years left to give the Mets another dependable control pitcher in the rotation. The new look Mets will be led in 1976 by manager Joe Frazier, who's enjoyed phenomenal success within the New York farm system, most recently at Tidewater. You got any more bills down there? <laughs> well, I wish we did. <laughs> We'd have them up here. Uh, we got some kids down there, Bo Claire and Diggles, uh, a couple of outfitters that I had that uh, I like. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, uh, a few more will come up the line. I'm a fundamentalist, real fundamentalist, and I believe and I'm aggressive. I'm very optimistic as to what the future holds. Uh, the Mets have a fantastic ball club. We've, uh, I've never been on a club that is so closely knit. Uh, there's some great, uh, great men on the club. 1976 looks like uh, it's going to be another one, another year that uh, I feel that we're going to have a very good offensive ball club. Uh, I said the same thing about 75, and we set all kinds of hitting records club-wise uh, and individual-wise. I've always been optimistic, and I think we have better offense than we ever had before, and uh, hopefully looking for another big year, or 
like 69 or 73 for us in 1976. You'll see a ball club that hustles next year. And you'll see a ball club that goes from first to third and second to home. Manager Joe Frazier promises to have the 1976 Mets running. This added dimension, along with an offense that showed tremendous improvement in 1975, a powerful pitching staff bolstered by Mickey Lolich, continued production from the veterans, and the valuable experience gained by the many youngsters makes 1976 a year that could provide Mets fans with a return to glory.